Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. This episode of The Short Term Show is brought to you by The Short Term Shop. If you're interested in buying a short-term rental in one of the top vacation markets in America, just go to theshorttermshop.com and click Get Connected with an Agent. If you purchase a home with the shop, you'll have access to all of our client-only benefits, such as training on how to manage your short-term rental. So we'll teach you everything you need to know from how to set up your Airbnb and Verbo listings to how to use the property management software that you'll need to streamline your business, all the way down to helping you source your local boots on the ground like cleaners, handy people, etc. We've taught thousands of people just like you how to buy and manage their vacation homes from anywhere in the world. So head on over to theshorttermshop.com and click get connected with an agent to get started. I do have to mention that we're brokered by eXp or else I get in trouble. We'll see you guys over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show. We are gonna change it up on you a little bit today. Really interesting topic sort of related to real estate in some ways, but not really, more personal finance. So today we have Brad Baldridge of Taming the High Cost of College. He's got a podcast, he's got a blog, he's got all these really cool resources about something that I think a lot of us are thinking about in various stages of thinking about is how we're going to get these kids to college, how are we going to pay for that, how are we going to pay as little for that as possible. So without further ado, I'll introduce Brad. Brad, how's it going? I'm doing great. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about you and your background first before we get into all the questions that I have about college planning. So will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a financial advisor and I've been doing financial advice since the 90s. And about 15 years ago, I started specializing more and more into the college planning because of Hey, you know, everybody's heard that college is getting very expensive. And because of that, it's becoming a bigger challenge for a lot of families. So it became a bigger part of most people's financial life. And as the more I talked about it, the more people listened and had more questions. And then I realized there's a lot of strategies that people can use. But in the thick of the college years, most families don't have time to and the inclination to figure it all out and do it well. They just kind of stumble through it. And again, and that's, you know, that's the way a lot of the parents have done it, right? If you have a parents of a teenager, you know, the way you did it is not the way you probably should do it for your children because the game has changed pretty substantially in the last 20 years. So that I think is kind of why I got involved. Um, and I still, you know, so now I'm helping families one-on-one. -on -one. We've got a course, we've got a lot of free resources, a newsletter all around college planning, but I still also work with families that are also saying, well, how do I balance college with retirement? And how do I make all this come together to get to not just college, right? But all the other goals as well. Yeah. And I think the the thinking about college really is just such a, a beast, so to speak. And you mentioned earlier offline when we first started talking about early versus late stage college planning. So I think a lot of people talk about, I think when we start to have kids, we're like, oh, I'm going to start uh, saving for college now and I'm going to do all this stuff right. And then you get busy with life and kids and everything, and some of that falls by the wayside. And then all of a sudden, you do have a teenager. So can you kind of talk about the differences in early and late stage planning? Certainly. And I think you and I are that exact contrast, because you mentioned earlier that you've got some young kids. I've got a bunch of old kids. I've got a junior in high school, a sophomore in college, and a junior in college. I am living late stage college planning. You know, with my youngest, we're trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. We got to do testing. We got to do visits. We got to figure out the whole college process. And of course, we've already done that with my older two, but it's continuing to maintain. Okay, how are we going to pay for year three? How are we going to pay for year four? And how does this all fit together? And how do we you know, get the most tax advantages and all the details there? So there's, so that's late stage. So late stage is you have high school kids and college kids. Early stage is you know, kids that are younger, right? Anywhere from middle school to, hey, we're pregnant. Should we be saving for college? And all of that is, you know, and again, at that stage, it's maybe saving and investing or how do we plan our life because college is in our future. 
when you actually get there, now it's college visits and testing and scholarships and need-based aid and merit aid and all the forms for applying and all the forms for financial aid and all the extra work that you need to do on top of, hey, I did a great job saving, so now I've got a big pile of money, but let's use it efficiently. Or I didn't do such a great job saving, so I don't have a big pile. I've got a little pile or I have no pile at all. How are we going to, you know, and again, most families aren't willing to say, you know, we didn't do a good job when you were six or seven. So college is canceled now. You know, certainly the parents I'm talking to, that's not the case. Obviously, they're reaching out for help. But for most families, I think they're not willing to throw college under the bus because they didn't do it well when they should have. So how do you go from where you are now to college is working out well for our family? Yeah. And I think that it's if your child wants to go to college, you know, it's not they shouldn't be punished because you got busy, you know? Um, So Mm -hmm. it's definitely, you know, it's definitely a hard thing. And especially now with the cost of college being what it is, it's just, I mean, it's, it's kind of insane and who knows what it'll be. Maybe the bubble will have burst. If there is a bubble, I haven't studied it enough. Mm -hmm. You might know the answer to that, but maybe it'll be different when my kids go. But uh, what do you, what do you say to that? The whole, the college tuition bubble and and all the rhetoric around that. Right. Yeah. I mean, college is very expensive and there's the there's a lot of rhetoric around too. Is is it worth it? And that's a challenge where, you know, for some it is and for some it isn't by on a purely math standpoint, right? If you get the right degree and have the right career, the earnings more than pay for whatever you paid for education. But if that doesn't work out, then the math doesn't work. But there's a bigger picture too, which is there's a lot of parents out there that said, you know, that say to me, you know, I went to college, I want my kids to have that on-campus experience. And that costs more potentially than, oh, we're just going to go part-time or we're going to go to the local community college and get our feet wet and somehow, you know, grow from there. And I think it's important too, to realize that different kids need different things. Not all kids are created equal as far as, you know, some are academic and they're going to do great in college. There's on the other end of the spectrum where college is probably not a good fit and to force them into it it is probably a disaster waiting to happen. And then there's the kids in the middle where it's like, well, maybe college is right. Maybe it isn't. I think that's the real challenging segment. You know, there's pretty obvious for some kids college, you know, not now, maybe not ever. For some kids, absolutely, you know, go on and earn your degree in engineering or teaching or whatever or nursing or whatever it is you want to do. It, it'll launch you into a great career and, and it should work great. So kind of working through some of that, uh, I think one of the worst things that the politicians ever did to us was that soundbite of college for everyone. That's, you know, patently bad advice. College for people that need college. Education for everyone is a little better way to say it in that, you know, and again, a lot of real estate people, you know, learned their craft, the school of hard max. You know, there is not necessarily... You go to school and and study it in college. You just get out there and start doing it. And that that works too. But I think yeah. most of us realize that we just have to continue to learn. And whether or not you use college as that springboard, you know, really depends on the family and the kid and and how it all works. You yeah, know. yeah. I think I mean, I mean, that could be an entirely other episode on on all that. Um, you know, for me, so. I have built my wealth on on real estate and I do have I've got a master's degree, but I also graduated undergrad at the worst possible time in the history of graduation, which was uh, spring of 2009. So there were no jobs. So I bartended for a very long time. And I would say that I learned as much about dealing with people from my years bartending as I did about business uh, in my master's degree. And I think that I don't think I would be as successful as I have been, not saying I'm the most successful person ever, but I wouldn't have found the success that I had if I hadn't done both of those things. So Mm -hmm. I think it just really depends, you know, as long as you're constantly learning, whether that's in a formal setting or not, then, you know, that's, that's always the goal. But let's talk about, let's get back to, we've gotten off on a tangent. Let's, let's get back to the savings. So what advice would you have for somebody who I'm going to ask you first about that segment and then about the younger segment, but for somebody who might've found themselves in the situation of, crap, I've got high schoolers and I just thought college was someday and, and now all of a sudden someday's here and they're kind of trying to scramble a little bit. What advice do you have for them in terms of being able to get the funds together to be able to help do this? 
Right. Well, I think first step is really understand what we're up against. So again, so let's look at some some numbers. So the average public state school is about twenty seven thousand a year, and the average private school is about fifty four thousand. Now that's their list price. That's the number they publish. Now for a lot of state schools, you pay list price, and it, you know again, it, the good news is it's it's the lower of the two. The bad news is it's still a big number for most families. When we look at the private schools, especially, they can be you know the average fifty seven, but the name brand schools are. 80, 90, 95,000, some of the most expensive schools are projected for the next year or two. So it can be very, very expensive. But what we really want to understand is it's the net price that matters. As an example, Stanford, which is a very expensive school, recently put out a press release that said, if your family income is under $100,000, Stanford will be free. You'll pay zero for room and board and zero for tuition. They will cover everything. Now, and if your income is between 100000 and 150000 they will cover tuition for sure, but you may have to pay some towards room and board. So there's a lot of families out there that say, well, Stanford's you know, eighty five, ninety thousand. We can't afford to go there. Well, if it was free, you probably could afford to go there. Now, the bigger, now the bigger caveat is Stanford is crazy as far as competitiveness. So your student literally needs to be a rock star in order to get accepted there. But that's a different you know, challenge, right? So and that's true of the of a lot of the elite schools where they're very expensive. They're also very generous because they have large endowments and they can afford to be generous. And then we've got our state schools and then we've got all the other public schools. So there's these different clusters of schools that work differently for each family. So understanding, will you qualify for need-based aid? Understand, will you qualify for merit aid? And then the reality of it is there's going to be a net cost for most families. And if you're upper middle income and above, that net cost could be very similar to the state school, right? So you can go to the state school for twenty-two thousand, or you can go to this school over here for twenty-four thousand, or this school over here for forty thousand, and then the school the student really likes, of course, is the one that's most expensive at forty-five thousand net. Started at eighty, but it's down to forty-five. That's the reality for a lot of families, you know. And sometimes you're lucky, and the low cost school is the favorite school. Sometimes not. And then that's the decision of, you know, going back to, well, is it worth it? I don't know. If you're giving up the lake home so that you can spend more money on college, that's your, you know, that's a lifestyle decision. What's more important to you? But if you're going to blow up your retirement or mess up your own finances in order to pay crazy amounts for college, that's a completely different scenario. So I've, I've seen families that can easily afford to pay for college. They just don't want to pay the crazy numbers, so they find ways to spend less. And I've seen some families that can't really afford the big numbers want to pay the big numbers anyway, and they really kind of blow things up. So you need to be real careful. And it's important, I think, that the parents are the adult in the room. They're the ones that understand what all these big numbers mean. And if you get sucked into the the hype and all the stress around college, a lot of times even parents make bad decisions because there's a lot of pressure and you know, people want to go to that name brand school and they want the best for their kids, right? Nothing's too good for my kids until right. you get the bill. And then you say, well, maybe that was too good for yeah. me, right? And yeah. most students don't really understand. So it's really up to the parents um, to, you know, kind of be the guardrails in this process. So you mentioned that people will typically try and find some way to reduce costs. What are some of the most common ways that people find to try and reduce some of those costs. I know when I was in high school, my English teacher was also kind of like a, a makeshift student advisor. We had an advisor, but she kind of worked on it too. And um, she was always yelling at us about this website called FastWeb that had these zillions of scholarships that you could apply for. And she would always say things like, well, you know, there's every now and then we'll see one where only one student applies. So they just get $10,000. And I don't know if that exists anymore, but is there something similar to that where you might be able to reduce costs in that way? Absolutely. So, and I have the scholarship guide for busy parents on my website that will go into it oh, in a little more detail. And it, and again, what this the scholarship guide literally is for busy parents, it's for 10 minute videos, just gets you up to speed. It's not going to solve your scholarship problem. It's going to help you figure out if you should spend time on it or not, because that's the reality, right? There's some kids out there that will apply to 20 scholarships and get zero. And they kind of wasted their time. 
another kid that, you know, will apply to those same 20 and get two or three and it'll be five or 10 or $20,000. And it worked out great for them. And for some families, it's need-based scholarship. For some families, it's merit scholarships. For some families, it's both. So really understanding, you know, where should you spend your time? And then there's the scholarships that come directly from the colleges. And in a lot of cases, those are a little less work for some of them, and some of them are more work. So scholarship is a is a generic term, and it covers a lot of different types of aid and a lot of different scenarios. So yes, we want scholarships. And we hear that, you know, especially if you go to a private school or you go to you know, some of those things where they talk about, oh, our kids got a bunch of scholarships. Okay, well, what does that really mean? And, you know, just because I sent my kid to the private school doesn't mean you're automatically going to get more scholarships than had you gone to the public school. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of that around the scholarships where certainly you want to pursue it. But the reality is education is something in the neighborhood of 60 billion a year. And there's only a few billion in scholarships. So now granted for most families, I, said, well, I don't need a, bi- you know, a billion. I, I could just get my little piece and that's more than I, you know, that'll more than cover it. And that's true. Right. But because everybody's competing for them, sometimes it's not worth the effort and sometimes it is. And in the end, scholarships can pay for it all for some kids, but it's very rare. Less than 1% of kids get enough scholarships to cover their full cost. And that includes the athletes and all the others as well. So it is a strategy, but it's a strategy for the right kids at the right time. And you need to have a plan B in case it doesn't come to fruition. This episode is brought to you by short-term rental listing advice. Join this Facebook group and post your listing to get advice from other hosts, including myself, on how you can improve your listing or just post your property so you can show off. Join us at strlistingadvice.com. That's strlistingadvice.com. Join me live every Thursday for a weekly Q&A all about short-term rental. If you like my vibe, if you're digging the long hair extraordinaire Cashflow Carl and want to ask me questions in real time, join me at strquestions.com. It's a lot of fun. strquestions.com. Com. So what would a plan B be? What are some other types of ways to, to reduce those costs? Right. So again, understanding your need-based aid and merit aid, obviously families can save and invest. For the real estate crowd, I think there's a lot of tax strategy, doing things like hiring the kids in the business to help you manage your real estate or mow the lawn or show up and paint or whatever it is. You know, to give you an example, in a different industry, I had a restaurant owner say, well, I, you know, my kids come in on Saturdays occasionally and they bust tables or do whatever. And I just pay them 50 or 100 bucks under the table. And it's like, no, no, that's completely wrong. Put them on the payroll, pay them very well, and then it's deductible to the business. And then they pay taxes on it instead of the business owner. And of course, kids don't pay a lot of taxes because they're in low tax brackets for money that they earned in as a work. They have a different, you know, it's different if it's unearned income. So there's a lot of tax strategies around hiring kids into the business. You can set up to it and businesses can set up tuition reimbursement plans. We, you know, heard about those large companies, you know, if you work for Starbucks or Walmart, they've got all these education benefits for their employees. Well, you can have education benefits for your small business. You just you know, have to understand the rules. And then, you know, you take that solo real estate professional. Mom works in real estate. She sets up a tuition reimbursement plan and surprise, surprise, who goes to work for her the next day? Well, one of her kids. So the big companies have these tuition reimbursement plans that say, if you get a A, we're going to reimburse you 100%. If you get a B, we'll reimburse you 80%. If you get a C or less, then we're not paying. Well, mom could set up something and said, well, if you get an F or better, I'll reimburse you. And that's perfectly legal. You just have to understand how it works and make sure you meet all the rules because there is a few gotchas in there as well, as far as how old the kids are and who owns the business. So yeah, I was about to, that was going to be my next question. So for somebody like my husband and myself, so we've got a bunch of real estate investments. I'm a real estate agent also. So what mm-hmm. age, my kids are very young. So what age could you put your kids on the payroll and for what types of work? Right. 
that's a state by state and talk with your accountant mm-hmm. type of thing. But certainly a lot of teenagers, right? It's teenagers that are able to do the work, but you know, there's rules around family farms and there's rules around family restaurants and that kind of stuff in many states where again, you you know, a 12 year old can't work in a general business potentially, but they could work in the family business. Right. If it's a farm or a restaurant or somebody, you know, so sometimes there's carve outs, you know, so it, can, it gets pretty complicated, but usually by the time they're 14 or 15, it's pretty likely that they could be hired. And a lot of times you can still hire them. You know, like I, I paid my kids to do laminating because I did, had a lot of projects where we, you know, and I paid them piecework and that was fine. I set them up as independent contractors actually and paid them piecework. So there's different you know, methodologies. And now my college kids, when they're home, they, they come and help me in my business and do what they can and mow the lawns and take care of my property and help me with advertising and et cetera. So all those things are, you know, pretty effective. Now, if they could make the same money getting paid by somebody else, now you have to, you know, I have that challenge where Wow, they're going to pay you $22 an hour to go set up tents and work hard. Well, maybe you should go do that because I don't have enough work, right, to keep you completely busy at that rate for sure. So finding that balance. Okay. So how much can you pay? What are the what are the limitations on what you can pay if you put your kids on the payroll? Like obviously, I would imagine you're not allowed to pay a 15-year-old $100,000 a year to like hold the iPhone while you take reels or something. But what can you pay them? And how does that pertain to the education reimbursement? Right. So you need to pay them a fair wage, whatever that means. Okay. So if they're doing IT work and, you know, you have IT quotes that are very simple, you know, that are 20 and 30 and $50 an hour, then you could potentially pay them that. You probably can't pay them $200 an hour to empty waste baskets. So Again, working with your accountant to understand the rules, right? Because that, mm-hmm. that will get you in trouble if your average employees are making $20 an hour, but somehow your kid doing minimal and low skill work is getting $40 an hour. Um, yeah. Got that it. would potentially get you in trouble. But if everybody's making 20 and you're paying your kid 15 to be the low man on the pole, that's fine. And if your kid becomes the high man on the pole, right? Oh, my kid's studying computer science, and he's setting up my network, which, you know, my average employee can't handle that kind of stuff. He's actually a more valuable employee. You could pay them more. And again, it's whatever's fair. So I, oftentimes it's like, well, I got a quote from a couple of lawn services to come and mow the lawn for the summer. And they wanted, you know, $45 a visit or $145 a visit. Well, that's what I'll pay my kid. Then I'll pay him $145 every time he mows the lawn. I think that's fair. You know, yeah. ultimately okay. that's, you know, that's where we, it kind of fits in is it has to be fair and reasonable. It can't seem like nepotism completely. Right. Okay. So I'm going to dumb this question down like really hard. So how does it benefit me as a small business owner if I'm setting up one of these education reimbursement plans to uh, employ my kids? If I, if it's going to cost me $200,000 to send them to college, it's going to cost me 200000 whether I just send them to college or whether I hire them and set this up. So what are the benefits for me as, as a small business owner of doing that? Most of the time, it's the differential in taxes, right? As the business owner, you know, you might be paying 25% federal and 7 or 8% state, and then maybe self-employment taxes on top of that. And you pay the children. And a lot of times they don't pay any taxes at all. I mean, my kids have never paid taxes. And again, they're not earning tons of money, four or five, six thousand dollars a year, but that's all tax free. And if you can save 30 or 40 percent of six thousand dollars times three kids, well, you do the math and go, oh, that, that's worth it. Tuition reimbursement plan works very similar in that it's tax deductible to the business, tax free to the recipient. So you could do that on top of the wages that you're paying, and they would get additional tax free reimbursement that, again, it's very tax friendly. Gotcha. And hopefully you're getting some work done that wouldn't be done otherwise. You know? <laughs> right. Are your kids a... actually helpful? Right. Yet to be determined with mine. So let's back up to little kids. Let's go back to early planning. So let's say we have our financial ducks in a row early in life and we in our kids' lives, and we want to start now because we know 
we, you know, we got all this rhetoric in the media of how crazy college tuition is now. And it's, you know, beating us over the head constantly. So we're like, we want to make sure if this is what our kids want to do, that they can do this. How do we, how do we start? Right. So let's quantify things a little bit. So if for a kid that's going to the state school right now, if you'd have saved about $200 a month and earned 8%, you'd have about a third of what you needed to go to a state school. So $200 a month times each kid might be, again, assuming you saved it from the time they're born until the time they're off to college. So that might be a good target to start with for some families. Now, some families are going to do 500 a month because they're saying, well, we don't want to go to state school. We want to go to a private school. And by the way, we didn't save the first five years because we were paying for daycare and that was thousands a month. So oh, once God. daycare ended. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> nobody told me about that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So once daycare is over, now we can afford to save. So we're going to redirect that daycare money before we learn how to spend it and we'll save it for college. Now, lots of people say, well, if I save it for college in a very specific college savings account, well, then I have to use it on college or there's a lot of taxes and penalties and that kind of stuff. So yeah, okay. Some families, maybe you don't want to save for college specifically. You just want to save in general so that you have some extra money or maybe you pay down debt or you know, I've had some real estate People say things like, well, we're going to get this property paid off so that we have a, and when college is here, we'll have this property with great cash flow that we can use for college then. And then, then it's not committed, right? If that, they're not going to college and you have to have great cash flow, you can just do something else with it. So finding that balance. But I think the biggest picture people need to think about is if you're going to spend and support a lot of college, by default, you need to do less and all of the other areas, right? You're going to live in a smaller house. You're going to buy less new cars. You're going to do something because education is a line item on your planning and it's going to take some of your resources. The bigger that goal is and the higher numbers, you know, the more kids and that kind of stuff, the, the more you have to back down. So what I see a lot is, you know, parents of a 17 year old earning $200,000 a year, let's say, and they say, well, we just can't afford to save a dime for college. I mean, we've got all these expenses and the kids are in all these sports and we got all this stuff going on. We just can't make it work. And then you know, the next guy I talked to says, well, we earn 150000 and we've got all this stuff going on and we spend every penny. And there's no way we can possibly afford for college. But if we were that other guy that earns 200000 then then we'd have 50000 a year to pay for college. It would be so easy. Well, what's the difference? Why is that? Well, Again, for most people, it's my bigger garage theory. I don't care how big your garage is, it's always full. And you always look to the, you know, I've got a two-car garage. If I had a three-car garage, I'd be so much better. But the guy that has a three-car garage looks for the four and so forth because you get enough stuff to fill up whatever space you have. Most families also learn how to spend their income before they learn how to save it often. And that gets them in trouble where they have a lot of commitments now and their lifestyle grows to what you know wherever they're at as far as income. So just being conscious of that and saying, all right, we're going to have to shave a little off our lifestyle in order to save for college specifically or just save in general. But we'd like to have 50,000 or 100,000 and you know put tucked away for college when we get there or whatever the number is. And you know, it's a you know there's always that challenge of I think college and education is changing. It doesn't have to be expensive, but for a lot of families that you say, well, I want, you know, I want them to be at the, you know, the big university in the stadium cheering with 50,000 of their favorite friends, you know, for that football team, like I did, that was a blast. I really enjoyed it. And there's a lot of parents that, and that's one of the reasons why college prices keep going up is parents are willing to make, figure out how to make it happen. They raised the prices, kids still came. They raised the prices, did kids still came. Why wouldn't they raise the prices? It's kind of like rent, right? You raise the rent and you're still full. We'll raise it again. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've actually, I've heard, um, this is an anecdote from a babysitter, actually, of one of my kids that we had a few years ago that uh, she went to University of Florida. We live in Florida and she had a friend who didn't get into, and I'm going to hideously misquote this, but hopefully everybody just gets to just University of Florida. I guess they have an online program and an in-person program and, uh, you can get into the, it's harder to get into the in-person and they, this kid got into the online program, you know, still, is still a four-year degree from university of Florida and just moved to Gainesville and did all of the college things while getting into this cheaper 
harder, easier to get into program. Again, I don't know all the logistics, but they were still able to do the college experience while saving money because they were doing the online rather than than the in-person tuition, which I found pretty interesting. I've not followed up on that to see what validity there is to it, but I found that interesting because I know a lot of a lot of colleges are offering full online programs now. And yeah. you know, who knows what the opportunities will be in 10 years. Right. Exactly. And I think things are, you know, education is slow to change, but I think it is education, especially for adult learners. If you look at what's going on with the adult learners, there's all kinds of different, you know, weekend programs, online programs, high hybrid programs, a lot of things that are there to make life better for the students. Whereas when you get to the undergrad, typical 18, 19 year old undergrad program, it's still very much, this is how we do it. And you don't like it too bad. This is, you know, no college wins, uh, wins students based on their customer service. <laughs> right. You know, they don't believe in that. It's you stand in line and wait, you, you know, whatever. Right. Whereas, you know, parents and students get very frustrated with that, but that's the reality of the, the dynamic is a little bit different. Um, and then when you get into the felt, you know, the, philosophy around college is like, oh, really, we're going to pay somebody and all they're really doing is making my kid read the book and act, do the homework. They could read the book and do the homework without going to college. Yeah. You know, so theoretically you could go teach yourself calculus. The challenge is most kids aren't motivated enough to literally do that. I am not for one. <laughs> right. Exactly. Without the college. And then of course the kids like the college experience, the you know, the social aspects and, the, you know, home away from home stuff. There's a lot of, you know, additional benefits that a lot of families, you know, kind of a halfway house. They're not at home, but they're not completely out on their own either. And they've got, you know, lots of professionals there that are looking after them a little bit and yeah. making sure they, you know, do what they need to do and stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And do they stay on the straight? How straight is that straight and narrow yeah, when you're off? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly they have their opportunities to to mess up their life for sure. But, and again, if you think about it from the college perspective, you know, they have their own police force and they have rules around drinking and they have rules around who can get into their housing and when, and, you know, it's locked down and there's a lot of, say, you know, again, it's not perfect. And colleges right. have been called on the carpet a lot around it, but name another business that has to protect their customers with a police force and have rules around personal responsibility, right? I mean, most other places is like, if you go drink and get drunk and do something stupid, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. And, but on a college, it's like, well, they still hear from the parents. So they try and do what they can to police it. Now, obviously, and stools with it, students with any sort of ingenuity will get around it, all the rules and do what they want anyway. We all know that. We've all done that. Mm -hmm, right. It's been there, right? But the point is, at least they're trying to do that. I think a lot of parents yeah. can appreciate that. Yeah. I, I definitely chose my school because I grew up in Starkville, Mississippi, where Mississippi State University is. And I wanted to go out of state so that I could, you know, run around and be a crazy college kid without everybody knowing my parents. So <laughs> that's what I did. But uh, okay. So what else have we not touched on that you think our listeners would benefit from hearing in terms of college planning? Yeah. I guess the last thing is to talk a little bit about the timeline. So generally, there's a lot of timeline restrictions or um, deadlines in the senior year of high school. So you apply for admission in the early in the senior year. You do financial aid early in the senior year. You get your offers from the colleges mid-senior year, and you make your final decisions and commit to a college by May of your senior year. But in order to be ready for the senior year, there's a lot of things you need to be doing junior year and even sophomore year. And I think that's where starting college planning earlier is very important for most families. Again, as an example, for the kids that are going off to college right now, you know, graduating seniors, we just they're going to graduate later this year in 2024. We just filled out financial aid based on 2022 taxes, which is kind of ancient history if you think about it. It was the taxes from their sophomore year of high school. So if you're currently have a high school sophomore you are in the tax year that the colleges are going to use to figure out if you qualify for need-based aid. And most people don't realize that, and especially for real estate owners, where you have a control over, well, which year should be a big year and which years should be a small year. 
Well, if you can plan ahead and knowing that college is coming, you can potentially do some need-based aid planning and figure that out and say, all right, this is what I'm going to do in order to qualify for more aid, or this is what I'm going to do in order to do my tax planning better, or this is what I'm going to, you know, so lots of different reasons to get involved, but there's a lot of different levers to pull and you need to start pulling those levers in the late stage planning as early as freshman and sophomore year. And then of course, if you've got a fourth grader or whatever, right, you still can also do the longer term planning around taxes and saving and all that stuff. So switching to from early stage to late stage, freshman, sophomore year, especially for business owners that have complex financial situations where, again, you've got a lot of levers you could pull. So you got to spend some time figuring out which levers I should pull. And it really depends on how much your income actually is and what colleges you're considering and you know how many kids you have. And there's so there's a lot that goes into that. But understanding, will I qualify for need-based aid or merit aid? And if I will qualify for need-based aid, are there, are there things that I can do to make it better? You know, financial aid is a little bit like taxes, right? Some people live their life and then they go to their accountant. And at the end, of you know, the accountant's kind of a historian. Tell me what you did and I'll tell you what the damage is. And they do that year after year. And eventually people rise up and say, you know, I don't like writing these big checks. Are there things I can do better so that I don't, they're not so big? Now we've shifted from filling out forms to actually doing planning. Same thing around financial aid, right? You're going to fill out the forms and then you're going to learn what the damage is. But if you can fill out the forms better, maybe the damage will be less. And understanding what you need to do and some of the things you might need to do might have to happen freshman, sophomore, junior year, not just senior year. That's a really good tip, especially if somebody is a you know, full-time real estate investor of making sure you're paying attention to that early, you know, in freshman, sophomore year. Cause that's, I wouldn't have thought of that myself. Like, Oh, senior year's here. I guess we're doing this. So right. Absolutely. really, really good. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on. If our listeners want to dive into this subject a little more, learn more about college planning, you've obviously been a really great resource and you have a lot of your own resources. Uh, where can they find those? Where can they follow you? It's all at my website at tamingthehighcostofcollege.com. Again, we've got a, a newsletter you can sign up for with a lot of you know ongoing tips and articles. And we've got podcasts, 150 episodes of a podcast, calculators to help you figure out financial aid and get estimates. And we're working on a, a course that's out there where you can learn more, uh, kind of on a learn-as-you-go type system. And of course, if you want, you know, some direct advice or what you want to have some questions, you can reach out through the website. There's a phone number there. There's a, a way for you to uh, just schedule a meeting and all that kind of stuff. All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much again for coming on and we'll catch you later.